Thank you. Thank you very much, Paivi. Um, it's great to be able to participate um, in this discussion, um, despite not having been able to make it to Helsinki this time. Um, so good afternoon. I'm speaking from Sri Lanka. Uh, it's afternoon time here. Great to meet you all. And it was fantastic to listen to all the excellent research and presentations um, that were given uh, by all of you. I would like to commence my remarks by personalizing uh, them for a moment um, and telling you a little bit about myself uh, because it relates to uh, conflict and the conflict in my country. Uh, so I am a child of war. I was born into the conflict in Sri Lanka and uh, for the first 25 years of my life, all I knew was conflict. Uh, so I grew up amidst bloodshed, brutality and insecurity right through uh, my childhood and adult life. Uh, also to say that I hail from a triple minority background in the country. So I come from an ethnic um, minority background, a linguistic minority background, and a religious minority background. And the reason to share this is because to say that it has shaped the way I view conflict and contribute to the resolution of conflicts um, in Sri Lanka and uh, around the world um, uh, in terms of all the work I do. I'm also a member of the Women Mediators Across the Commonwealth since its founding in um, 2018. Um, so being a child of the war and from a triple minority background, um, I was determined uh, from the time I was growing up to be a part of the generation and to be a part of a movement that does everything possible to ensure that there is no resurgence or relapse to conflict and war in my country or the region, because we see the consequences uh, of war and I have seen it real time growing up. Um, so moving on to the insights I wish to share, I um, want to say that they do link with what I've been hearing all the panelists speak about in terms of uh, the impact of conflict on displacement, um, violence, uh, women as ex-combatants, and the aspect which I want to share some perspectives on and which is also connected to some research that was conducted by the women mediators across the Commonwealth is the role that women play in leadership and in peace processes. This is also very relevant to me um, because I have been uh, very involved both uh, in informal and formal processes of peace building in the country. Um, in Sri Lanka. And also you may be aware that Sri Lanka has both of the first woman prime minister in the world. And we also have had the first woman president in Asia. And I had the honor of working with her uh, when she headed the Office for National Unity and Reconciliation, where I um, worked under her um, chairmanship leading the process for drafting and developing Sri Lanka's first national policy on reconciliation. Um, now, the reason to share this is because in this policy, and I would like to speak a little bit about the importance of uh, policy processes and the, in, the uh, impact it has for contribution of women in, in inclusion and meaningful inclusion in peace processes. And I come from a perspective of um, saying how involvement and meaningful involvement of women in peace processes is important from three perspectives and they relate to all the themes of the presentations that were shared today. One is of course, um, to provide them agency. It provides power, it empowers women when they are given a seat at the table and provided an opportunity to contribute and shape these processes. The second, I would argue, is that they have an impact on protecting women um, from violence, from further violence, and also for speaking on behalf of those um, who have endured violence. 
and also sharing perspectives on how women are impacted by violence. Uh, the third point I would like to argue is that meaningful inclusion of women in priest processes also helps in their healing. So whether they have been uh, female combatants, if, if uh, be they have been victims of violence, um, uh, I believe that being involved and provided the agency and empowerment to partake in peace processes is a way of providing agency for them and empowering women. So what I would like to do is to just share with you <coughs> an example of two provisions that we included in the National Policy on Reconciliation in Sri Lanka. Uh, it is a way of illustrating how a woman's involvement in peace processes can help address and resolve in a post-war context all the issues that were discussed today from being ex-combatants, from being victims of violence, um, from being victims of forced displacement, from being war widows, and so on and so forth. So please allow me to read two provisions um, from the National Policy of Reconciliation of Sri Lanka. Uh, the first was uh, is a substantive provision. And just to say, these are not the only provisions that make reference to women. We were very keen to ensure that the gender dimension and the gender dynamic of conflict and peace was reflected throughout the policy process and throughout all the clauses. Now, just to take you through one of the substantive clauses, I call it the equality provision. And this is how we defined equality. And you will see how it covers the spectrum of issues in conflict and post-conflict resolution. And I quote, um, to ensure gender equality in all national initiatives, develop protection mechanisms for vulnerable women around the country, redress and provide reparation to women who have endured violence. And here we mean all types of violence and promote agency of women as partners in decision-making and as agents of change. So as was mentioned by Paivi and others today, um, this is a recognition of the fact that women should not be seen merely as victims of conflict and in post-conflict state, not merely as beneficiaries of peace programs, but they should be viewed and empowered to function and serve as equal partners um, in peace processes. And the only way that can be done meaningfully is with a conducive enabling environment. The second procedural uh, clause that I would like uh, to share with you is how we looked at ensuring that the gender dynamics of conflict and peace are seen throughout the process of policymaking and through its implementation. And I quote, to proactively look for gender relevance at every step of policy implementation and when designing reconciliation and coexistence initiatives. To build a culture of respect between women and men through reconciliation initiatives and while recognizing that a large number of women have been victims of conflict and violence and require redress and reparation they must be engaged as equal partners in reconciliation processes with space to contribute and participate in dignity. So you will see how these provisions and clauses and this perspective and vision is so wide ranging that it does not ignore or neutralize or trivialize the impacts of war on women and them being victims, but also emphasizes how it is important that they be elevated to being equal partners to contribute and participate in dignity. And very quickly, I would like for this to flow into my second um, very brief set of comments of research conducted by the women mediators of the Commonwealth, which I've been a member of, um, where we looked at when speaking about women's meaningful inclusion in peace processes, what are some of um, the factors, uh, the enabling factors that contribute to the meaningful inclusion of women in peace processes? Of course, there are several and uh, they are non-exhaustive, but why I'm sharing with you about four or five is just um, as a beginning of the discussion. And these are shared um, from the point of view of 
enabling women peacemakers to apply skills to good effect, but also to highlight that the priority and intention is to fundamentally transform the wider peacemaking system. So what does this mean? It means to make peace processes more inclusive and equitable. That goes beyond the focus on direct armed conflict to include structural and societal violence. So not looking at violence only from a direct individualized perspective, but from a wider structural and societal perspective, which often are linked to patriarchy in societies. So just to highlight very quickly, um, a few enabling factors that came out of our research. One is the importance of networks and even being a part of such conversations, discussions in communities such as this in today's platform is an example of how um, it enables and encourages and improves women's participation. So it was found that local, national and international networks play an important role in bringing women together across geographies and identity gaps. They act as an effective mechanism for support and collaboration among women peacemakers, as well as a conduit for qualified women to find entry points into peace negotiations. Networks also act as a support mechanism for career development or as a means for establishing a collective voice to advocate against obstacles. The second point I would like to highlight is the importance of visibility and recognition for women's participation and contribution in peace processes. So very often their roles, impact and success are overlooked. Yet women are known to work across multiple spaces and tracks, both informally and formally and in between. So recognition of women's value within formal peace processes is minimal, and this has to be beefed up and improved. The, sec the third point I would like to mention is the importance of role models, which often act as an important source of inspiration and encouragement for women in peace processes. I can personally vouch for this through evidence, having worked with the former president of Sri Lanka directly under her chairmanship, um, where she served as a role model for me in guiding and mentoring me through my work and even beyond. So this really provides agency and empowerment for women. The fourth point to mention is the importance of intergenerational collaboration, which refers to both to support and mentorship for younger women by older and more experienced women in peace processes, but also conversely, for younger women to share their fresh insights and perspectives, they come with less baggage. And for these to be shared with the senior women mediators and peacemakers, while of course preserving respect and appreciation for expertise and wisdom. And final point to mention is the importance of training and professional development, which is critical in, adv in advancing careers of women. However, a word of caution here, is that very often training is often seen as an easy solution for engagement of women in peace processes and this pitfall should be avoided. It is important that to note that it is insufficient unless systemic barriers that prevent access to formal spaces, formal peacemaking spaces and peace negotiations are addressed that such training and professional development will not see dividends. So those are um, a few insights I would like to share. And I would like to conclude uh, with a question um, to uh, all participants, to all presenters here today, um, coming from this perspective of meaningful inclusion and leadership of women in peace processes. I'm very curious to know uh, whether it surfaced anywhere in your research findings or analysis, how women's impact of violence, of forced displacement, of being ex-combatants have affected their role and participation in peace processes. How have they shaped, how have they impacted um, the role they play in post-conflict or post-war situations of peacemaking? Has it affected it? Um, and maybe it didn't uh, surface and was not in the purview of your research, but I'm very curious to know whether any of this 
surfaced in the analysis or findings. The second part of this is to ask um, whether if there was any um, analysis or findings on how these rules impacted the participation of women or those women in peace processes, did you find that they were more comfortable in informal peacemaking roles or did they feel more comfortable in uh, engaging in formal processes? Did you see a difference or not? And finally, of course, um, was there an opportunity to see how young women, um, uh, young women's roles in peacemaking were affected by being victims of violence, um, by being ex-combatants or being victims of uh, forced displacement? So I would like to conclude my remarks there and thank you for your patient hearing. Thank you very much, uh, Salma, for your, uh, for your intervention here and tying it all into how it leads to peacemaking and participation. So thank you for those comments. So, I would, while uh, I saw that uh, all of our panelists took note, of course, Augustine, I couldn't check on you because you are not visible at the moment here, but uh, that you took notes of uh, uh, comments uh, and questions made by you, Salma, but I thought maybe we could also take, in addition, few few comments and questions from the audience and then get back to you. Would that be okay? So uh, let's start uh, uh, there in the front, please. So, all right, it came. Uh, all the presentations were really so informing and great, thank you. I have one question for Diana and Joseline and one for um, Carlo. So for the uh, first presentation, I was just wondering if you have found any, I know you presented the summary of your findings and I will definitely read the uh, uh, working papers. So were there any intergenerational effect of the displacement and exposure to conflict? And if you have found any age group differences, uh, I, I was really curious. And also if you can comment about the impact of education so were there like more vulnerabilities, I assume, for the lower part of the distribution? And uh, my question for Carlo, uh, you mentioned maybe you can extend the discussion about the least uh, experiment. I was just really curious about it, how, if we have time, how it was possible really to ask these very sensitive questions in an anonymous way. So I will be so glad to, if you can extend it. And also the country differences are so, Great. I mean, it's at the same time alarming. So, wh what do you think about like cross-country uh, quantitative analysis of sex violence and also gender-based violence? Because it seems you know there are lots of bias already for the existing studies. So, if they do this country cross-country you know comparisons, thank you. Thank you. Let's move to the next one. I'd also like to congratulate all the panelists for really engaging uh, presentations and um, to our discussant as well. So thank you very much, all of you. I have two questions, and the first one is um, to Carlo, and then a follow-up to Augustine. So um, for Carlo, I'd like to see whether you can expand a bit on um, how gender analysis informs your work and your approach to the subject. Um, so particularly, I would um, be curious to know how, what sort of framework you use, how um, patriarchy or differences in power relationships between men and women frame your, uh, the way that you ask the research questions and your understanding of their results. Um, as we are in a gender session, so I have one more question, which is to Augustine. Um, so it was a very fascinating presentation, and so thank you for that. I wondered whether you'd um, trace through any of the impacts of the strength in female leadership, both at the formal level and at the level 
of um, competence in the peace and informal more, or civic, civil society organizations to outcomes in Liberia um, post-civil post war. So for example, in land holdings, in representatives in parliament, or in other kind of indicators of gender equality. Has there been progress as a result of these greater um, representation of women at l different levels of the political economy? Thank you very much. And I see one more question at the back row there, and one here. So yeah. let's take those two, if OK for you, and then we'll uh, go. Hello. Hi. Um, Juha Seppala from the Nordic Development Fund. So um, we fund climate projects um, in, in developing countries. And for our projects, um, they have to be 100% gender mainstreamed, and we do require a gender analysis. So I was just wondering in um, conflict or post-conflict situations, is there something that a gender analysis should take into account beyond what is usually done? Or is there something that is, is sometimes forgotten um, when a gender analysis is carried out in, in such uh, more, more difficult uh, situations? Thank you. Uh, the presenter on violent and non-conflict violent in uh, Liberia, violent and non-violent combatants or groups in Liberia. My question is, uh, what are the emerging uh, conflict of interest among this group, the violent and non-violent non groups? Because you, you made mention of Sri Lanka, Liberia. There should be a variation, or, and, and, and there must be some conflict of interest among these groups. So how can you extrapolate conflict of interest of that of Sri Lanka and Liberia? Thank you. Thank you very much for the questions. And now we have uh, questions from our discussant and from the audience. So I th I'll give you a chance to respond. And do you? Let's start from the order of presentations. So, uh, Diana and Jocelyn, if you want to start, please. Is it working? Great, thank you so much for these thoughtful questions and particularly um, the question about intergenerational effects. So one of the things that came up for us when doing this work was we were struck by the implications this has for the cyclicality of conflict. So if you basically understand that, you know, a lot of the um, effects of violent conflict can become hidden but create these kind of ripple effects within communities, um, it's important firstly to acknowledge that, but secondly, we know that in our own research, and it's been super well established in the literature, that a huge risk factor for both perpetrating and experiencing violence is exposure to violence in childhood, right? And we certainly saw that in our work. So if someone had witnessed their father beating their mother, they had experienced violence within the home, they were much more likely to be a victim of multiple forms of gender-based violence. And we also know it's linked to perpetration. So the question about kind of how um, this research speaks to the intergenerational effects, I think, unfortunately, it's not direct. We haven't been able to trace some of those intergenerational effects directly. But one of the things that I think you raised that would be fascinating to do in future is look at whether exposure to violent conflict during certain sensitive periods changes the way that you might then think about violent conflict and experience GBV going forward. You know, is exposure in that really sensitive moment around the age of 12 to 15 more impactful than exposure at other times? And that certainly goes back to the remarks from this morning as well and, and you know, the thinking about those sensitive periods and how that comes up. Um, and I know Diana will have something to say about the role of education. We did see that that varied a little bit from context to context and how significant it was, et cetera. Um, so um, I'll just speak briefly to that, and I was going to just appreciate the note about um, the conflict, climate, gender nexus. I will say it's something that um, we had a slide and moved it to the additional slides just in the interest of time. But in my personal work, it's something that we think about a lot and really exploring how we can better understand the um, gendered impacts of climate change 
really analyze them more thoughtfully and also think about um, the intersections between GBV specifically and climate change. And I think we've talked a lot during the conflicts about problematizing the fact that it's really hard to identify climate change broadly as a driver for migration or as a driver for many of these issues. A lot of times people talk about, you know, it's hunger, it's scarcity, it's, you know, other kinds of dynamics that are um, created by climate change, but people often don't name it in that particular way. But I think we're getting better and better at working it into our analyses and better and better at starting to quantify some of those impacts. Yeah, no, thanks. I mean, just to add on the education, we see it both as a protective factor in some cases, but not always, and in different um, quintiles of uh, wealth when we look at that as well. Um, so, but it's not always uh, in the same relationship, and so you'll see that in the papers. And then on um, what to, to look at when gender mainstreaming and climate change, I think that's a really great question. One of the motivators of our research was to really show kind of the continuum of violence that was experienced by women, but also how forced displacement and conflict increases those experiences of violence. And I don't think that we're asking systematically how, if you've been displaced and um, looking at the different forms of intimate partner violence or other forms of violence that might be experienced because of displacement and conflict, usually uh, because of the framing coming from Security Council resolutions, we really dug into sexual violence as a weapon of war. And I think we have to expand our understanding of the continuum of violence that women face in public and private spaces. So I would say, don't ask if you've experienced gender-based violence in your uh, analysis, but I do think you can recognize that there is vulnerability with displacement and exposure to conflict that then can be tied in to the interventions and policy recommendations that you would implement within a community where you know that one out of three women has experienced some form of violence. And then on top of that, if you've been forcibly displaced, you're more likely to have experienced violence within the home or outside the home. And that's something really important to take into account because I do think that climate change interventions or interventions across multiple sectors have a role to play in either preventing or responding to the needs of women who've experienced violence. So I would um, like to see in any type of gender analysis, a recognition of the experiences of, of women who've experienced violence, not just to, to put them in, in the framework as victims, but they're survivors and they need support uh, to continue on their uh, path of healing. So that would be something I would recommend. Okay, um, I'm gonna respond maybe to your question first. Just. I don't want to take up too much time, uh, but perhaps could you help me uh, pull up the presentation and I can give you a, a brief taste how this looks like, right? And we could talk later on. Um, I think this list experiment is actually quite uh, easy to implement and, and useful and effective uh, way to understand um, sensitive attitudes. For instance, if you imagine attitudes towards uh, FGM, towards uh, victim blaming, things that people just don't want to share to an enumerator that they don't know, right? So, I mean, it, it's the same for us, actually. Uh, if I respond to a survey, I may not want to share certain sensitive information, and that's the same for people in, in uh, conflict-affected populations. Thank you so much. So, the way this looks like is... Um, so, it basically looks like that, right? So, you have... Uh, people are being asked to, res to tell you how many experiences of a specific list of experiences they um, experience, actually. Um, and you will randomly split the sample into a control and a treatment group, so the survey software can do that. Um, and then only the treatment group will receive the sensitive experience. In this case, it would be, for instance, sexual violence, but it can be uh, racist attitudes, it can be substance abuse or anything, right? Um, and then you can basically um, do some, some modeling and, and understand the prevalence of the sensitive experience or attitude. That's, that's how this works. Um, so the country differences, right, uh, that you uh, mentioned. 
I think what uh, the most striking finding for us was that there are indeed, I mean, there are some country differences, of course. Uh, I mean, it's social science research. It's, you know, it's a lot of uh, noise in data typically. But what is still striking is like that across all three countries for this uh, local civic participation, which I think is a relatively good proxy for everyday peacemaking and peace building, right? So when, and that relates to Salma's point actually. So if we find that people are more engaged in their communities, right? Um, that there is more associational life. That is actually how everyday peace making and peace building looks like in communities. We don't have this, I mean, sometimes there are these uh, local level peace uh, conferences, but that is a rare event, right? The common form of peacemaking at the local level is interacting, engaging uh, with your fellow community members and also with people outside of your community. And we don't have uh, a lot of data on that on a cross survey level, but for Congo we had we have more detailed data and um, what we find here is it's not just about being member of a, a community association. This, this effect is across a lot of different other outcomes that we could interpret as a good measure of local um, life. So it's about the frequency of interpersonal exchanges, it's about uh, engagement in events, so for instance participation in community-based work. It's, there's a little bit of an effect on, on donating behavior and also organizational leadership and, and membership. So it's, it seems that this is uh, a more general pattern actually and it lines up also with some prior research. Um, right. <sighs> I, I want to touch upon this point, uh, what kind of gender analy analysis informed our, our research, right? Um, in a way, we depart from a lot of the traditional gender research because um, we both are um, what I would describe as, as empirical social scientists. Um, so we have a, a, an, our approach is generally to have a theory-guided research question and hypothesis that we then uh, try to empirically answer. And a lot of the literature, of course, comes with this uh, perspective of gender analysis, right? So a lot of the more normative literature, a lot of the uh, case-specific literature has an inbuilt gender analysis. And that's actually our, what we would refer to as null hypothesis, right? So we would assume that uh, a lot of the patriarchal norms in a society uh, would make it very difficult, actually, for women to, or for people who both women and men who are victims of sexual violence, right? So we need to be very clear here that this is not, I mean, the majority of, of survivors are women, but it's not that men are not affected at all. So uh, I think this is, we, we come more with a kind of, um, a, we, can, we come with a sort of like open, open approach into that actually, and uh, recognize the, the large um, gender-based or, or feminist literature which is basically the backbone to all this research, informing not just, of course, our studies, but a lot of the other quantitative literature as well. And I think that the point that we want to make here is that, although it's not a traditional approach in, in, in uh, gender studies to use quantitative approaches, it has been shown, among others, uh, Dara Cohen's work has been really, I would say, revolutionary that um, it can it can account for selection bias in purely qualitative work, um, and and show patterns that haven't been recognized before, right? So it can basically help to um, investigate some widely held assumptions, actually, and 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 see uh, and basically ask new questions or help ask new questions. you and uh, if you don't mind let's check Augustine first yeah would you like to go next yeah thanks for the questions I mean uh, the both questions are excellent questions by the way uh, I will start off with the one that has to do with uh, emerging conflict of interest I mean setting the case in Sri Lanka where actually um, I think Sri Lanka and Liberia including Rwanda they have almost similar scenario. I mean, 
And study has proven that both uh, all these countries suffer like they have structural change at the end of the armed conflict. I mean, because we had like, a, like because there was a failure of the male dominated systems, a lot of male dominated systems that have failed. So, like in Rwanda, I mean, women became prominent, they became breadwinner because due to the absence of their male counterpart who died during the conflict. In Sri Lanka, there was a structural change, as well as in Liberia, of course, failure of male dominated system. How be it, I mean, back to the core of your question that has to do with conflict of interest between the two groups, the combatant and non combatant in Liberia. The reason is that the non combatant group has a specific interest, their interest is regime change. And that group is not a standalone group, like the group I show you is not a standalone group. Is, is a component of a rebel group. And a rebel group they call LAR, Liberian United for Recon Reconstruction and Democracy. That's a segment of rebel group has a female brigade. And the goal of that rebel group was regime change. The other group, which is the non-combatant group, their goal was peace. So they were like a form of mediator. So in terms of interest, conflict of interest, of course, you know, doing peace deal negotiation. You see, most of the time, you, you find out that a uh, warring faction or warring group will have to be fighting during power distribution. That is, who gets what? Who gets political position in terms of a peace deal? Like, if a law rebel, the raw rebel group says, hey, I need the finance minister, or I need the minister of defense, I need this job. These things, these things usually happen during a negotiation of a truce. But the non combatant group were exclusively out of that because their interest was just peace. They were not really interested into political positions. But the political positions were interested by the, by the belligerents. Belligerents usually get a share of the power. Because as a general rule of thumb, doing negotiation and settlement, I mean, you got to divide the position in accordance with or in proportion with what the group territory or whatever it is, depending on the internal dynamics of. The negotiation. So at that level, you don't see interest collide as much. But what happens during peace deal as time, you know that the women, women or youth are also incorporated because it's incumbent upon negotiators to incorporate uh, uh, the civil society, for example, the media, the interfaith council, the women, the youth, they are all incorporated into the peace deal. Yeah, the, I hope that I've answered your question. All right. On the issue that has to do with uh, representation at the, uh, the formal and informal sector, that's a, that's a great question. And I think you had that, like, like Sema, I worked for a female president for 12 years, Ellen Johnson Salib. I mean, uh, and I, I'm proud to say that, I mean, she had a very excellent leadership. Now, uh, actually, what happens uh, in Liberia, we had this Patricia Dominated Society that was back in the days where women were not allowed to own property like land. I mean, women could not own the land in Liberia. I mean, but, but that have changed, times have changed. The first thing that Ellen did was, for example, like land issue, she established a land reform commission. Land reform commission means people can own land irrespective of who you are, irrespective of your gender, whether male or female. Another thing is, I mean, there were women chiefs or female chiefs, if you like, like chief of police was a female, chief of immigration, a female, or justice minister, female, even at the court where the Supreme Court, Supreme Court bench have female, they're, they're not there as associate justices. I mean, also there's in the military, the military set a court type of female, you know, prior to the conflict, the military has been viewed as a male dominated game. I mean, Hey, the AMA is for the male, for the male, not for the female. But after the war, I mean, right now we have a deputy chief of staff of the armed forces of Liberia. It's a female. She's a general. I mean, these are the kind of reforms at that level. Also, there were free education for female, for, for girls. And that was that was co-launched by uh, Michelle Obama. She flew into Liberia and they launched a free education for girls. And one thing that she did that's very important too. Was was a rib law. The rib law was kind of a little dominant, or if I would say passive, but became very active on her regime. I mean, you had you had the rib law in force, and there was some legislation, especially in terms of marriages. 
you have men marrying uh, girls as low as 12 or 14 years old. And these were, these were law and policies that she actually repelled. At the local level, you had chiefs, uh, like traditional chief or village chief becoming female. You have uh, traditional women groups uh, coming to prominence. I mean, and, and a lot of female were being given or awarded chief titles. These are titles that were predominantly set for male prior to the conflict. So all in all, I believe that she don't wear, especially in terms of the rule of law and other aspects, both formally and informally. Thank you. And Dami Lola, please. Thank you so much for your question. I would like to say that um, from examples I've seen, women tend to turn to informal networks and organization. Uh, examples, we have uh, loan committees, we have mother groups and neighborhood alliances. All these are set up to speak about conflict, to resolve conflict, and uh, basically non-violently and most of the time informally. And they also adopt what we call um, conduct shuttle diplomacy, try to negotiate, con um, there's a kind of negotiation that is conducted by a mediator between somebody who doesn't want to come out uh, to be seen. And so they, they try to adopt these means. And most of the time they do this informally because as at now, we don't have women in those formal positions that can actually speak, except for the non-governmental organizations that are taking the roles, some of these roles. But when it comes to government positions, formally, women are still lacking. They are not, we don't have many women in Nigeria. But when it comes to performing the roles in informal settings, in the local settings, these are some of the tools. And they also actually engage in marches and protests. In Southern Cardinal, Cardinal women came out to protest. They came out in blacks when there was a killing of their young boys and men. And they kept shouting and crying to the government, stop killing our young boys, stop killing our men. In Southwest Nigeria, Ekiti women came out to protest in white, with white, and for them it was kind of symbolic and a kind of a ritual also against, and all these are informal settings. But of course one of the things I noticed about this informal model of, uh, of presenting the agitations is that they have a kind of somebody who, who stands for them like a mentor, like somebody who anchors such protests. But most of these net networks are done by individuals and they are done informally, not like the Liberian cases where we have now women in formal positions and in peace negotiation. We don't have such cases in formal, but we have a lot of women agitating in informal networks. That's what I would say about Salman's question. Thank you. Thank you everyone for your responses. You're going to be so busy during lunch break here, uh, uh, continuing this discussion. Now I wanted to ask Salma, do you have any where your questions addressed and anything you would like to say at the just like one minute? Sorry about that because we are a bit over the time. And you're on mute, I think. Your responses most fascinating and interesting. I just want to respond to the question on gender analysis and what uh, can be included and what tends to be missed or something additional that would add value to a gender analysis. Um, I would just like to um, uh, suggest or propose three aspects that I would like to add to a gender analysis. One is the recognition that women are not a homogeneous group. So when gender analysis is done within a community or society, uh, very often um, women are categorized under one umbrella, even though it is disaggregated for between different communities. So I would like to say that even within a community or society, it would help uh, to disaggregate um, the focus and the data. Uh, the second point to mention is, I think it's very important and I have seen it personally in my work um, in Sri Lanka, um, is the importance of looking at intersectionalities. Um, so the positioning of women, um, and this is very close to linked uh, linking with understanding their agency and how they can be involved in leadership later is their intersectionality of factors that lead to the social uh, and cultural position of women in societies. And the third point to mention is also uh, to look at 
the capabilities or the capacities of women to be leaders. So women from different groups uh, or different societies uh, or different backgrounds have different capacities and capabilities uh, to contribute to um, processes, peace processes uh, at the formal or informal levels. So an understanding of that also um, could very well be helpful in agenda analysis. Thank you. And now when you started, I can't resist the temptation also to say gender analysis. Make sure you have a dedicated gender expert doing that one. And the second one is I might actually not do a separate gender analysis. I would make sure that my climate analysis has a very strong gender expertise, part and parcel and working there. If I'm doing conflict analysis, it should include gender analysis as part of it, or economic analysis. It should include gender expertise and gender as part of it, so that it doesn't become a separate siloed issue, but a critical part of whatever is going on. Just couldn't resist the temptation of saying, it was a fantastic panel, excellent interventions, and uh, thank you so much, everyone. I'm going to reach out to you uh, after this because there is so much in all of this uh, research what we, for example, at you and women are going to need for our work. So, and I'm sure many others, I see others nodding here, so it's the case for many other organizations as well. Thank you so much for you all audience. Thank you for joining and listening this most in, in, uh, interesting presentations. And, uh, I guess enjoy your lunch. Sorry we kept you a little bit late and hungry from your lunch, but it was worth it, right? Thank you.